I'm extremely pleased to be at the Centre for Social Justice uh, with um, uh, its very distinguished record in publishing very high quality reports in matters uh, which we're concerned about today. And today, I'm going to talk about uh, the issue of whether there is justice for the vulnerable. Um, I'm going to talk about how police forces in England and Wales should and must provide protection to those who are vulnerable. The vulnerability of people to crime is at the very heart of what the police do. It's what they're all about. And as we all know, the primary purpose of the police is to prevent crime and disorder and to protect people, particularly the most defenseless and the vulnerable in society. And in the policing context, vulnerability isn't usually applied to every potential victim of crime because we're all potential victims of crime. In this context, in the policing context, the term vulnerability is used to describe a condition of, a condition of heightened susceptibility to harm from crime, usually concerning people who are in need, are in need of special care, uh, special support or protection uh, because of their age, their disability, or their risk of abuse or neglect. Now, how do we as a society and the establishments within it protect those who are vulnerable, that's not a new debate. And looking solely at the protection of children, and they are amongst the most vulnerable because they have the most to lose. Let's consider some of the more recent history of child abuse. In, 19, uh, sorry, in 1889, Parliament pra passed a statute, the Prevention of Cruelty to and Protection of Children Act, that was commonly known as the Children's Charter. It enabled the state to intervene for the first time in relations between parents and their children. Police could arrest anyone found ill-treating a child and enter a home if a child was thought to be in danger. And that act included guidelines on the employment of children and it outlawed begging. Move forward over three quarters of a century to the public inquiry in 1974 into the death of seven-year-old Maria Kowal at the hands of her stepfather. The resulting report into that affair highlighted a serious lack of coordination among services responsible for child welfare. It led to the establishment of area child protection committees in England and Wales, which coordinate local efforts to safeguard children at risk. And then followed the Children Act 1989, which provided that every child has the right to protection from abuse and exploitation. And then came the Protection of Children Act 1999, which was concerned with preventing paedophiles from working with children. And there were other measures and statutes which followed, but still the abuse continued. Forward again to 2012 in a BBC headline which read, Chances Missed to help a child who was murdered by his mother and her partner after suffering terrifying and dreadful abuse. <coughs> this related to the case of four-year-old Daniel Pelka. A serious case review found that Daniel was invisible at times and no professional tried sufficiently hard enough to talk to him. He was starved and beaten for months before he died in March 2012 in Coventry. The court heard that Daniel saw a doctor in hospital for a broken arm, arrived at school with bruises and facial injuries, and was seen scavenging for food. A teaching assistant described him as being a bag of bones, and the trial heard that he was wasting away. And at the time of his death, Daniel weighed just over a stone and a half, 10 kilograms. Now, of course, much more recently, there have been the cases of very severe sexual exploitation of girls <coughs> at the hands of gangs of men who have treated them as worthless as human beings, mere commodities to be passed around, assaulted, and raped. And there are other examples that I could have used. Now, this isn't comfortable to read out, and nor I appreciate for you to hear nor is it intended to be read as a history of establishment attempts and failings to protect the vulnerable. That would take far too long. But until every vulnerable victim is protected and kept safe from harm, the reality of what happens when this isn't possible needs repeating. And what is common in the cases I've mentioned, and in far more names and far more tragedies, 
is that the circumstances of these cases are rarely new. Neglect, physical abuse, mental cruelty, these are not new problems, and they're not problems which are going to go away. Familiarity with these problems must never be allowed to cause complacency. The cases of these individuals must stay in the spotlight. And HMIC contributes to this through its reports. It is timely here to emphasize that Parliament established HMIC in 1856, and this has not been disturbed, as an inspectorate, not a regulator. Regulators have powers of intervention, direction, and enforcement. Inspectorates do not. An inspectorate's authority, its power, its capacity to be a catalyst for improvement and to start the process or accelerate the process for good to come, comes from the quality of its work and from its voice, from its authority. HMI speaks directly and principally to the public in terms that ordinary people can understand. It is for others, principally chief constables, to act on our reports. And our reports also provide elected representatives, mainly police and crime commissioners and their London equivalents, with evidence, analysis, judgments, and recommendations in relation to the efficiency and effectiveness of the police. HMIC operates independently of the police, of ministers, of police and crime commissioners, other players in the criminal justice system, independently of everyone. And that independence, which was conferred by Parliament and has recently been intensified by Parliament, is both precious and essential, and it will never be compromised. It allows the public to know and to trust. Our statutory remit contains no political criteria, and our objectivity requires no less. But more importantly, the victims of crime require no less. That is particularly true in the case of vulnerable victims, including the victims of abuse, who can naturally shy away from and mistrust any individual or organization that they see as the establishment, especially if they have been let down by the instruments of the state in the past. HMIC is now more conspicuously separate from the police. There are six inspectors of constabulary, four of whom have backgrounds outside the police, all of them in the professional practice of law. HMIC's allegiance is entirely clear. It is an allegiance to the law and to the public interest, and it has no other allegiance. And the law and the public interest demand the protection of all citizens, with special emphasis on people who are especially vulnerable and defenseless including, as I have mentioned, of course, children. Over the last three years, HMIC has inspected from many angles the ways in which police deal with vulnerability. And I'll just give a, a few examples. In 2010 and 2012, we looked at how well police forces in England and Wales understood and responded to antisocial behavior. That involved the largest survey of ASB victims and in 2010 concluded that there were, while there were professional and motivated officers working hard on tackling the problem, more needed to be done to identify vulnerable and repeat victims. And we found that progress had been made on this when we went back and reported again in 2012. In 2011, HMI Drew Sharpling led a review of the police response to rape cases. And that found that while the service provided to rape victims was improving, rapists could be convicted more quickly and more successfully if the police and the Crown Prosecution Service made better use of intelligence. For instance, the review found that forces did not at that time fully understand the potential use of partial DNA samples in eliminating suspects or directing investigations. They did not sufficiently regularly check records about foreign nationals, even though that information is available to all forces through Interpol, to help identify a pattern of offending by a foreign national, or to make links between offenses here and offenses committed abroad. 
In 2014, HMI Sharpling led an inspection on the use of Section 136 of the Mental Health Act 1983, which provides that if an officer believes that someone is suffering from a mental disorder in a public place, and that person is in immediate need of care or control, then the officer has the authority to take that person to a place of safety so that his or her immediate mental health needs can be properly assessed. And I know that the Centre for Social Justice has also examined the issue. Now, use of Section 136 should only be an exception, but we found that it was happening regularly with more than 9,000 people detained in police custody under Section 136 in 2011-12. In many of the cases we reviewed for the Section 136 inspection, the reason why police custody was used as a place of safety was not always properly documented in police custody records, and there were many other failings which we identified. <coughs> now, although these people had not committed a crime, those detained under Section 136 who were taken to a police station were generally treated like any other person in respect of the booking in procedure, risk assessment, and ultimately being locked in a cell rather than taken to another part of the police station. And we recommended, amongst other things, a reduction in the amount of time someone detained under Section 136 could be kept in police custody. It's therefore good news that on the 27th of May this year, the Home Secretary announced that the new policing bill uh, for this session will include provisions to cut the use of police, service, police cells for Section 135 and 136 detentions reduce the current 72-hour maximum period of detention for the purposes of medical assessment, and continue to improve <coughs> outcomes for people with mental health needs by enabling more places, other than police cells, to be designated as places of safety. In 2014, we also published the results of a major inspection into the police response to domestic abuse. Now, some of the statistics in that report are stark and they are startling. In the UK, one in four young people aged 10 to 24 <coughs> reported that they experienced domestic violence and abuse during their childhood. One in four. Forces told us that crime related to domestic abuse constitutes 8% of all recorded crime in their areas and one third of their recorded assaults with injury. Evidence indicates that 90% of domestic assaults, in 90% in of domestic assaults, children are in the same room or in the next room. Well, let's just pause on that statistic for a moment because it has far reaching implications. The research shows that as adults, children who have witnessed violence and abuse are more likely themselves to become involved in a violent and abusive relationship later. Children tend to copy the behavior of their parents. Boys learn from their fathers to be violent to women. Girls learn from their mothers that violence is to be expected and something you just have to be put up with. Several studies also reveal that children who witness domestic violence are more likely to be affected by violence as adults, either as victims or perpetrators. So domestic abuse is a significant and severe child protection issue. Other work that we've done in this field included our report entitled Mistakes Were Made, which was an examination of how the police handled allegations against Jimmy Savile of his <coughs> abusive behavior. An inspection from earlier in this year on the treatment and identification of vulnerable people in police custody, and we carried out joint inspections examining the treatment of offenders with learning difficulties in the criminal justice system and examining responses to children and young people who sexually offend of appropriate adult provision and the experience of young victims and witnesses in the criminal justice system. And that list goes on. And our work continues. Our inspection staff are currently in forces conducting an assessment of the police's response to vulnerability in the round. Now what did these previous inspections find? It's estimated that the public only report just over a quarter of incidents of antisocial behavior to the police, about 20, 28%. Now even that low reporting rate led to around three and a half million calls to the police in 2009-10. And by way of comparison, around 4.34 million crimes were recorded in that same period. 
The number of arrests of children fell by 24% between 2011-12 and 2012-13, and that continued the downward trend since seen since the peak in arrests in 2006-07. On average, the police receive an emergency call relating to domestic abuse every 30 seconds. But more widely than this, we found a mix of consistency and inconsistency. The inspections found consistency across England and Wales in there being many extremely hard-working, dedicated prof professional officers and staff who are devoted to improving the often piteous plight of the vulnerable. The inspections found huge inconsistency of the treatment of vulnerable victims by the police. Now let me reiterate that. Inconsistency in the treatment of victims. Not just in how systems and processes to identify and support the vulnerable are established and run, although we found that too, but also inconsistency in the experiences of the police of, for example, a young mother who hands herself into the police because she's hearing voices in her head and she doesn't know where else to go. Or of a three-year-old who has been physically abused by those who should offer him only love. Or of an elderly person on the receiving end of sustained antisocial behavior who is too afraid to step outside his front door. None of this is comfortable for us to think about, but as members of the community, it is imperative that we do all think about it, and that we at HMIC advance and promote improvements to the service provided to the vulnerable by police officers and police staff. Now, I have acknowledged before, it certainly bears repeating, the difficult and hugely important job of the police. Police officers and police staff see people at their very worst, and often at their most <coughs> desperate. The public has very high expectations about how they respond. And those dealing with vulnerable victims have to deal every day with stories and circumstances with which many ordinary citizens would be quite unable to contend. Now it's worth emphasizing that this includes not just vulnerable victims, but also vulnerable offenders. Offenders are often victims too. Not all of those who are vulnerable are grateful for support, and of course they shouldn't have to be. But I'd like to emphasize that the police have both to comfort and confront vulnerability far more frequently than most of us. They have to find ways to support those who want no support, who are kicking and spitting and fighting against it with all their strength, as well as the crying toddler who's lost in a shopping center. As I've mentioned, HMIC's inspections without fail find evidence of very dedicated and professional staff going above and beyond for victims. And I should like to take this opportunity again now to thank those dedicated and professional individuals working with and for those who are vulnerable in the most difficult, sensitive and distressing circumstances, taking great personal responsibility for the people they're helping. The community is very much in their debt for the arduous work they do and for the successes that they have. But this area of vulnerability and how the police respond to it, it is a difficult landscape. It's a distressing one. Difficult and distressing. Now those adjectives have a couple of things in common. Both are true, neither is going to change. So it's imperative that forces do all they can to provide the best care and service to the vulnerable so that justice will be done if it can be done. In too many reports, including HMIC's domestic abuse report from 2014, we reported that these dedicated officers are doing a good job in spite of their circumstances rather than because of them. Another in spite of relates to interagency work. Given the significant interdependency of the different agencies and institutions which are concerned with the prevention of crime, it is undeniable that appreciable limitations on the resources available to them will have consequential adverse effects 
on the efficiency and effectiveness of the police. But it must always be remembered, of course, that once a crime has been committed, it is the police who bear the responsibility of investigating it, apprehending the offender, and taking the case to the appropriate point in the criminal justice system. It is unsustainable for any police force to decline to attend, act, and properly investigate crimes of a serious nature, such as abuse and domestic violence. Moreover, the trust and responsibility which the community has given to the police go much further than an expectation that the police will react to reports of crime. Many crimes are unreported, sometimes because victims are vulnerable or otherwise afraid. Examples include so-called honor-based violence, forced marriage, female genital mutilation, domestic violence, sexual offenses, and offenses against children. I want to pause here because I believe that one of the most significant problems faced by our society, and therefore its police, is unreported crime. Now, of course, because it's unreported, it is impossible accurately to measure the size of the problem. But two of the most important unreported crimes are those involving vulnerable people and crimes committed online and using modern communications technology. One of these has been corroding society and destroying lives for many generations. The other is new, growing, and presents very significant dangers of another kind. Both of them are the subject of two of the HMI, HMIC inspections, which HMI Sharpling will talk to you about in a few minutes. It's the responsibility of the police proactively to look for these crimes and to devise and implement measures designed to increase the confidence of victims in reporting crimes and in giving evidence. It is for the police also to persuade those who erect and maintain barriers which prevent victims appealing for and receiving help. For those people who erect and and, 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 and maintain those barriers to know that they will be pursued and prosecuted. Those who knowingly and deliberately create or tolerate the conditions in which crimes are committed and in which victims are isolated from protection and justice should be given the most potent grounds to fear the criminal law, operated and applied vigorously by the law enforcement institutions of the state. Reactive policing is only a part of the function of the police. And chief constables, police and crime commissioners and others should never dismiss or disregard the imperative of keeping everyone safe, especially the silent, the fearful, and the weak. The police need to learn lessons from the past and improve the prevention and detection of these crimes. They need to recognize and protect children at risk and treat cases of child abuse and sexual exploitation as a strong indicator of an extremely serious and prevalent problem, rather than as isolated incidents to be investigated and brought to justice on their own. We're under no illusion about the operational difficulty of investigating child abuse and child sexual exploitation. But of all cases involving vulnerable victims, those involving children deserve the most assiduous and urgent attention. Not least, this is because the true scale of this type of offending is still to be measured. But what we have so far seen is only the tip of an iceberg. So what can HMIC do to help this? We have a duty to inspect and to report. That is what Parliament has set us up to do, and that statutory limit has never changed. But let me be absolutely clear. It's not our job just to go into a police force, ask if a policy has, uh, has been established for attending cases of child neglect, and then walk out giving them a clean bill of health if they say yes. We do much more than that. We inspect. We get the evidence, we check, we analyze, we form judgments, and we report to the public. We play our part 
in helping to protect children and other vulnerable people by asking the difficult questions, by triangulating the evidence, by showing that behind every misrecorded crime is a victim who may not get the support that he or she needs. And so far as we can, by listening to and repeating and amplifying the voice of the victim. And that goes especially also with the case of crimes that never get on the books. I should like to announce today our commitment to providing child victims with a louder, clearer voice, a better opportunity to be heard, for their plight to be discovered, understood, and properly dealt with. The duty on us is to lend the authority and the strength of our voice to their true expression of the desperate circumstances of their suffering. It is for us to shine a light into the dark corners and onto the dead ends of systems that sometimes let them down. From this year, every HMIC inspection will ensure that relevant aspects of child protection are considered. In addition to our specialist national child protection inspections and the joint inspections of child protection that we carry out with Ofsted and other inspectors, every HMIC inspection will consider the implications for children. Child protection is complex and multifaceted. It touches virtually all aspects of policing, from the very local, through, for example, neighborhood officers' awareness of the presence of registered sex offenders on their patch, to national and international specialist work, for example, to tackle the radicalization of children and young people. We've already taken steps to ensure child protection is at the heart of what we do. And we're currently working to ensure that inspection work in the vulnerability part of our annual All Force Inspection Program has a strong focus on police forces' management of missing, missing and absent children and on their preparedness to tackle child sexual exploitation. Police processes and systems should never leave vulnerable children lost in bureaucracy at best and vulnerable to further abuse at worst. The sufferings of children and the risks that other children will endure those sufferings in the future are of the highest and gravest concerns of the whole community. It is the duty of every member of that community, particularly the police, and the other agencies of the state to intensify their efforts to ensure that everything is done to rescue children from the perils of abuse, from the perils of sexual exploitation and neglect which are so prevalent in society. Risks which are intensified by the dark applications of modern technology. Their cries are the indictments of us all.